Welcome back, everybody, to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. It is Friday. You know what that means. I am joined by the one and only Mike Wall. You can follow him on Twitter at Mike Wall68. Of course, you can follow him on Process to Perform as well. Mike, how are you doing? How is your Thursday treating you? Andy, my Thursday is treating me great. Thanks for having me on. I actually have a tattoo appointment later today, so I'm pretty excited about that. Getting the Pack a Day podcast logo. How uh, did what, you know? What, yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first one. Andrew Murtag, one of our uh, podcast hosts on Friday's audio edition of the podcast, has a pack a day podcast tattoo. So if you need any ideas or suggestions from him, you can re- I can get you his contact information. Bob- Bobby Kaberski, who was a Naval Academy guy when I first got to Green Bay, he had the Super Bowl tattoo on a and you know and you know in the moment like I that I'm the guy who at some drunken sailor thing would have been like that is a great idea you know what i mean yep and then you wake up the next morning and go ah. mistakes were made yeah at least they spelled everything right yeah that's good no regrets uh let's start with the trade deadline uh this obviously the big buzz this week i think there was some i don't know hope or idea that maybe green bay would get something done uh mm-hmm. per the reporting it sounds like they were very much in on chase claypool got outbid by the Chicago Bears, there was another report by Tom Silverstein as well as Rob Domovsky that there was a significant offensive player that they basically had a deal in place with, a name that wasn't necessarily known on the trade market, uh, that the deal was basically done. And then the team pulled back and said they decided they didn't want to trade the player. We don't know who that is, at least of, as of this recording. But at the end of the day, Green Bay does not get anything done at the trade deadline. A, are you surprised? B, what are your takeaways? And C, what does that mean as a player if maybe you're thinking that you're going to get some reinforcements coming in and all of a sudden there's nothing and you just have to go about your business as usual? So let's take it from the perspective of the, the player sitting in the locker room. Yep. So so Aaron goes on the Pat McAfee show on Tuesday and says, we hope that I'm hopeful that we'll have some breaking news here. And, and maybe that may, like the Silver Scene Damoski thing. Um, I'm sure those guys are, you know, I know those guys, they're, they're, they're completely legit, but like, yeah. I, I get, I get a little bit tired of, there's a big story that nobody can talk about and didn't happen kind of thing. Um, but I know they're completely, but maybe, so maybe that's what Aaron's talking about. Yeah. But if I'm sitting in the locker room and Aaron's going on these other shows, cause we've already had this conversation multiple times about how he's sending messages to people. And so what Aaron is saying, if you think about it is Aaron is saying that the job that I am doing is not good enough and I need to find reinforcements. And he could be talking to me about me directly. He could be talking about another group. But the, the um, assertion there is that our team is not good enough to, to compete at the level we need to compete at. And so when you don't get anything, when your quarterback goes out and makes that statement and then you don't get anything, I think it's natural for everybody to feel like, A, is it me? Right. And what can yeah. I do to make myself better so I can help this team? And he doesn't have those kind of feelings. And then B, if it's not me, I'm probably like, well, the best player on our team thinks we're not good enough. So we're probably not good enough. Um, so I, you know, the words matter and the who says them and when they say them, I think matters. I'm not surprised that I'm, I, I'll be honest with you. Like, I'm, I'm happy they didn't pick up Chase Claypool. Um, I was, for whatever reason, I'm not a huge fan. I'm with um, you. Yeah. I, 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 I would have, been very happy uh, having kind of been following Brandon Cooks for his career. I would have been very happy if they would picked up Brandon Cooks, um, if it would have been reasonable, obviously. But he he would have immediately vaulted to the number one spot here, and he could have he could have helped in a number of ways in the slot uh, out at X. Um, but it's not the tradition of the Packers to go out and, and pick up guys, uh, I, and I don't know if it's a statement on the guys that we have here, or it's a statement on the fact that we don't have a very good chance of making the playoffs and they don't want to bring on another contract and there's some sort of thing that's going to happen at the end of the year with having to repay, you know, have to pay somebody some money because I'm getting my draft picks and I feel tied to them. Um, a lot of teams don't want to give these quote unquote, like half year tryouts to, to players. And I, I completely understand why Goody doesn't want to do that. And, you know, the other thing, Andy, that I would say is, you got rid of the best receiver in the league. The best receiver in the league left the team. You didn't get rid of him. He left yep. the team for whatever reasons. And the story behind that is still, you know, a little bit, you know, who he said, she said. You're not going to pick up anybody who's anywhere near that in, in this deal. And if you look at it, the real other need on the offense, at least, is like Billy Turner. You miss, you need a Billy Turner. And, and, there are not very many, and you know we can 
we've debated how good you think he was or anything, but like, there's not a lot of Billy Turner's out in the league now. No. And so they're, they're extremely valuable and teams don't want to give them up. And I think maybe the most interesting thing about the, the, the whole process for me is like value. There is such a value at offensive line right now. Cause there's so many bad offensive linemen in the league that you just can't, you like, you just can't have enough of them and you can't find them. You can't like, we imagine where we'd be right now. If they had kept Billy Turner at right tackle this entire thing, we didn't have to go through this whole ordeal. Like, we 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 could make I could make the argument we'd we'd be up a couple more wins. No, I, and the thing about Billy Turner, and I think you hit the nail right on the head, is like I think I I think you probably liked him a little bit more overall than I did. But one of the things I said all along is like let's just say he's like a little like if you're grading him out like a little bit towards the negative side of an offensive lineman. That is still a very above average offensive lineman in today's NFL because yes. there's just not a lot of them out there. So even if he is getting beat more than you would like to see or those sort of things, like it's still what I would consider above average. And like relative value for you is exactly, still high. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, so like you, look, you look at Billy Turner and you're like, if you're, if you're looking at like value of players throughout the league, you look at Billy Turner, you're like, man, he's like, is he, is he really that good? But then you look at some of the alternatives across the NFL. And if you don't have like a, even like a Billy Turner-esque offensive line, a lineman that can go out there and play multiple positions and cover for you or needed and be um, like what, what the biggest thing I would say about Billy Turner is you can put him out there at almost any spot on the offensive line and you don't have to change your game plan. Right. It may, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to maybe be ideal, but you don't have to put an extra guard or like an extra uh, tight end into chip. You don't have to put a running back in that is going to have to be aware of what Billy Turner's doing. Like you can go out and run your game plan. And it's there is play. so much value in that along the offensive line right now. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree. And I, and I was never sitting here thinking he was an all pro, but you know, the point being, there's just not a lot of guys like that in the league. And, you know, we always talk about – and the other th – we always talk about these these skill positions, which are important. But you look at, like, maybe the biggest play of the day yesterday of Bradley Chubb going to Miami, like reinforcing because they – because why? Because you got to go get Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. Well, yeah. who stops them? Offensive line. You, you know, it's offensive linemen. There's just not a lot out there. It's it. The other thing that's always interesting about the dra the, the deadline, and I know they could think about moving this back till like the Thursday uh, or the Tuesday before November or whatever, but or, or before Thanksgiving, excuse me. There's a talk of doing that, right? But it's always interesting, like Packer fans, anybody in the NFL, like they could have traded for a guy in July. Like they knew, like they knew what their problems were in July. It's yeah. not it's just because the, the the day comes up, so you get real anxious. But the truth is, like they could have done this any time, and they decided not to do it. So we should be surprised they didn't do it in the last day. And it's interesting, like you mentioned, obviously offensive line. Um, when I had done like players that Green Bay could potentially be interested, everyone was focused, hyper focused on wide receiver, maybe a tight end. I mentioned like I would be after some of these. There was rumors that maybe Jack Conklin from the Browns. Oh my be, God, he's so good. Been. I know exactly. Oh. There were rumors of him being out there. Uh, that that's what I would have been looking at. Yeah. I think it's noteworthy. And to your point. That unless I'm forgetting somebody, I don't think there was a single offensive lineman traded. Andre Dillard, the left tackle for the Eagles, who they have depth that offensive line is and starting for them, former first round pick. There was some thought that maybe he would get moved. I think the Eagles being undefeated are like, why are we trading depth away? Um, and we could need this guy eventually. It doesn't make any sense. But there were no offensive linemen traded. And if Green Bay really wanted to probably shore something up at that position, um, I, was it you that said it? I think maybe it was you who said it, or maybe I was listening to somebody else, but like, Protection is going to be coverage, um, and if you can get enough protection up front, like you're going to have more time, and even wide receivers that aren't Devontae Adams are eventually going to open up. Yeah. Um, there's just not those guys out there, and it's really difficult to find offensive linemen. Yeah, and that's why you see, you know, when like when you, for fans out there, like when you talk about the horizontal passing structure that we have, when you talk about his, you know, his time to throw, that's the lowest that he's. At, you know, this is all affected because you don't feel confident that you can stop the, the pass rush. I mean, that's everything. As much as there are statistics and and glory around skill positions as there should be. Yeah, they're special players. As 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 important as all as fun as that is to talk about. The, ultimately, if you don't if you can't stop your quarterback from getting hit, you really don't have much of an offense in this day and age. And when you look around the league, Andy, and you see the points are down since like the lowest since like 2010. Like I would just say that it's not a coincidence that the points are down and we can't find an offensive lineman to trade away because nobody wants to give up a good one. Yeah, no, I don't think it's coincidence at all. 
And I also think we're like, I don't think it gets talked enough how many really, really, really good pass rushers there are in the league right now. And like, it, I don't know if I want to say it's like a golden age, but it's not far off from it. There is a ton of talented pass rushers out there and there's just not the offensive lineman to match up right now with it. And when you've got guys like Aaron Donald, you know, rushing from the inside and yeah. it's coming from all angles now and teams have gotten better at coming up with creative blitzes. Like it's just, it's a, it's a tough league to play in if you don't have an offensive line and we're seeing that and, and even the Tom Brady's the Aaron Rodgers uh, those quarterbacks who can't get the protection that they need it's become a major issue for them yeah I watched uh I watched Jeffrey Simmons last game he's so freaking good and I, I'll be honest with you I've only watched him for two years and just kind of been like I don't see it yeah. because yeah. I, I played against I played with Chris Jenkins and against Chris Jenkins I played against Hainsworth when he was angry and I just looked at Jeffrey Simmons. I go, yeah, okay. He's just like, he's just a guy, right? Yeah. He, it, the thing about these pass rushers now and those, these players, and I'll say this now, he's not just a guy. He's a good, he's, a, he, he dominated that game. It was, it was as rare a dominant performance as I've seen in years. He absolutely physically dismantled the interior offensive line for the Houston Texans. And what guys are, and, the disparity is, is the gap in that position. I know we're going off on a tangent, but the gap is so large between the Jack Conklins and Laramie Tunzels of the world and everybody else. The, the gap is so large that these pass rushers, like you say they're the golden age guys. I'm not disputing that they're really good, but I'm saying there's so many of these, these bad players out there that it is it, it must feel – like a 31 flavors every Sunday afternoon. Like you must be walking into Baskin Robbins every Sunday afternoon, unless you're playing like six teams in the National Football League. There's six teams that have guys across the board. The rest of them, man, it's all you can eat. You're going to the, you know, the King's Buffet or something. It's it's ridiculous how you can find gaps in these whole in these offensive lines right now. Speaking of Jeffrey Simmons, Packers will get to see him in a couple of weeks. They've got a Micah Parsons coming up. They've got an Eagles defensive front that's insanely ridiculously good. They're going to face some very good defensive fronts in the coming weeks, and that will be a massive challenge for this Packers offensive line. Let's step back and take a look at Packers bills, though. I feel like this has been, and I mentioned this earlier in the week, I feel like this has been a bit of a Rorschach test for people, uh, specifically on the offensive side of the ball. Um, some people will say like, hey, they found their identity. They started feeding Aaron Jones more. They got a lot of good rushing yards and we saw what could happen and they, they, they were able to score it. Like I saw some of that clearly. Uh, the other side and where I sort of lean a little bit more is that the Bills were sort of okay with Green Bay chewing the clock and kind of doing their job for them. We're never pressured in the second half. Um, we're constantly up double digits and never really felt, again, any pressure from the Packers. So curious where you come out, uh, specifically on the offensive side of the ball, obviously any other takeaways mm -hmm. from the game, but did you feel like this was a step in the right direction or the Bills being uh, pretty nonchalant about what Green Bay was doing? The Bills off the Bills defense, you know, their base defense is nickel, right? And they and they keep seven down there as the extra linebacker. Uh, I forgot is, is Jackson. Ron Johnson, the, the corner. Johnson, yeah, yeah. They they keep him down as the extra linebacker if you go 12 personnel with a guy like Tunyon. Like if you don't bring in two like meat house Mercedes Lewis real tight ends. Okay. So they're averaging three and a half yards per carry against against that nickel based nickel defense. And so I think even though they were putting five and six man boxes. Even though they're playing shell, and even though Von Miller at some point was like, "Dude, are you guys gonna ever throw the ball?" Like, you still have to play, and you have to block, and you have to make cuts, and you have to, you have to, you know, cut off backside slants like David Bakhtiari did when they're bringing the safety off the edge. The offensive linemen still have to execute. The running back still has to execute and run through tackles. I think that's important. And, and quite frankly, like when you average seven or eight yards a carry, like we were for most of the game, that's better than what we're averaging passing the ball. Yeah. And when you when you go through that game series by series, we weren't being stopped necessarily because we were running the ball. We were being stopped because when we passed it, something bad happened, whether it was a sack, whether it was an incomplete pass, the wrong route, overthrown. Um, there aren't going to be a lot of – I mean, what people have to understand about – when you're playing the Buffalo Bills and your defense is not is 16th in the league and they're number one in offense, like the last thing you want to do is give them more reps. Like the Buffalo Bills, they could have scored. Let's be honest. Josh Allen throws a, a, a pick. He throws two picks that you're just like, why did you even throw the ball? It was stupid. Yeah. And and I, it's great for our guys, and you're happy for them. And people got you, know, you got to make plays. But the truth is, that could have been a 40 point game very, very easily. And 
the more opportunities you give a team like that, I think from the Packers standpoint, it's not like you're giving up, but you do have to say, we're not going to win this game going in and trying to throw with Josh Allen right now with the weapons that we have, even though we have Aaron Rodgers. It's like we put in play, so I'll give you – we wouldn't play Peyton Manning in, in the Indianapolis Colts with Brett. And this is when it, Peyton Manning was starting to get MVPs, and Brett was like – Brett wanted to show him that he was still the guy. But Indy, you know, because they had a number one offense, they had a number one defense too because they just started rushing the passer the whole time. And so we stuck with them. I want to say we stuck with them for three series. So it was like 21-21 or 17-17. Every we were scoring, 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 scoring. We went and had to punt the ball away. And it was never close after that. Because the more opportunities you give an, against an average defense, which we were back then and we are right now, yeah. good quarterbacks with elite level receivers, dude, it is it's gonzo. You have no chance of keeping up. So you might as well shorten the game as much as you can. If you're going to average seven, eight yards a carry, like we just didn't convert a couple times, but that could be a much, that could have been a couple breaks here. And you could say that about every game. It could have been closer. It certainly could have been further away as far as the score. Yeah. The, the two interceptions were a bit perplexing from Josh Allen. Um, I was listening to a, an NBA podcast the other day, uh, low post podcast, one of my favorite podcasts and Richard Jefferson, who obviously does a great job breaking down the NBA was on. He was talking about his time with the Cavaliers um, and when the Warriors were obviously in their their prime and how basically they would spend the regular season facing worse teams. This is when LeBron was a Cav uh, facing worse teams. And they would be basically in the regular season playing games as if they were playing the Warriors, you know, trying to do things, even if the other team wasn't necessarily, um, you know, set up to be like play like the Warriors. If they had a shooter like Steph or Clay, they would do things that maybe wouldn't be best against that individual team, but they knew they were going to have to be great at when they faced the Warriors. There's a part of me in that second half for the Bills who just felt like the Bills are not bothered by this game at all. Like they, they might very well be working on things for the Chiefs or like knowing that they have to put up points in the second half, even when they may be up. Like it just didn't feel like that the Packers gave them a whole heck of a lot to chew on. And ultimately at the end of the day, it was always a double digit game in the second half. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, I think defensively you're right. You know, I mean, it, again, we just talked about it. If they don't have those two picks, which are inexplicable, honestly, they, they drop at least 10 more points. Yeah. You know, if, if not 14. So in the game's a blowout. I, I, their defense has been structured so they win at the line of scrimmage. They have two, like, all pro level linebackers, in the, especially in the run game with Tremaine Edwards and Matt Milano. They just play at an extremely high level. And they're able to bring pressures off the slot and kind of create some mismatches in the run game with, with some of their run, their run stuff if they have to. But they're very comfortable playing back. You know, Micah Hyde's out. They've been playing back with Poyer and in, in, in the, the rest of their secondary. And they can make plays at the line of scrimmage with, with their box players. They're just saying ours are better than yours, and they've been able to do it. So, again, like I'm not, I'm not dismissing anything you say because I think what you're saying is very valid. But I do think that those guys are out there trying to play hard. Oh, no, and, I agree. And and the fact that the fact that we can run on those looks, and you look at the execution that we had, especially from AJ Dillon running behind his pads. Like you, you know what you're going to get from Aaron Jones every week now. AJ starting to run up behind his pads a little bit more. Um, Deguara finishing blocks, right, dude? I, for the first time ever, I singled out Robert Tunyon as a guy who's like finishing guys and, and try. Everyone's trying to carry their weight right now, and if if all you get out of that game is that everyone's trying to carry their weight like they should be in the running game, then like for me, it's a win. I don't really care if you know. I mean, we we're going to lose the game either way, and we talked about it last week. It's like how you lose the game matters. Yeah, no, I definitely think there's takeaways. And I've been, actually been very impressed with, with Tunyon and his effort in blocking this season. It's been, and this game was probably the best version of that. Josiah DeGuara, I thought, played arguably his best game as a Packer this past week. There was definitely some positives to take away, um, no question about it. And I'm hoping they can carry that over against the Lions and going into the remainder of the season and be more of that physical football team on the ground and win some games that way. Because I think that's the formula we were looking for to start the season. Uh, we didn't really start to see it until maybe a little bit more this last game. Let's talk about uh, one of the, the offensive linemen. Let's talk about Zach Tom. Uh, he gets his second consecutive start, moves into left guard. Uh, I'll obviously let you be the expert here. My uh, untrained eye felt like the first part of the game, first quarter-ish, was you know he seemed a little bit overwhelmed. Ed Oliver kind of got the best of him a couple times, kind of got pushed back into the pocket. I thought as the game went on, he settled into that game very, very well and seemed much more comfortable as the game went along. Yeah, I agree. He's got hip pop. 
He's just got something you can't teach um, from an athleticism standpoint. That's why everybody's so excited about him. Look, Ed Oliver looked like an all pro for the first quarter and a half, two quarters of that game. Right? Yep. He was everywhere. He made every play. And even when he didn't make plays, he was making plays. He's, you know, disruptive. Um, what the Packers started doing in the second half is they started, they started cutting the defense. They started doing a lot more man down blocking, pulling guys around and getting on the edges. Um, and then, or, or they would run uh, combo blocks with the tight end and the tackle and get on the edge that way. And so it kind of takes Ed Oliver out of the game. Um, because he's they're not necessarily the kind of penetrators along the lines of like a Quinn and Williams, right? Right. So I, I thought that Zach Tom, I, I see just like you did. Um, I was really impressed. There's a couple of plays in particular where he had to. Uh, there was a third and one where he had to single block. They had a double team on the backside D tackle that was playing shade, and then he had a three technique with that Oliver, and he did a good job of just you know getting through that guy initially with his hips and pushing him out of the way on a third and one play that was big. There was a couple of pass protection plays that I thought that he just plays with a really good bend. He's he doesn't have a very good relationship with the ground, which basically means he's up like off of his heels and onto his toes too too much. So he has a hard time right now like redirecting. But his patience and like he the way he you know can pass off games with with Bakhtiari, like he's going to be a high level player. There's just a lot of technical stuff you have to go through with him. He's young and he, he didn't play you know at the at the biggest. You know, Wake Forest is an ACC school, but it's not like you know it's not tackle you. So I, I, you're happy with him, but if we're being Honest, I don't think Ed Oliver even played. You know, the, the last ten minutes of the fourth quarter, it's just like right. Boyer's out, Oliver's out. All of a sudden, things start happening. Like we could point to that too, right? They start throwing the ball. Why? Well, I don't know. Ed Oliver and Boyer are out of the game. That that, that could yeah. be part of it as well, right? So as soon as the pocket becomes like more of a wall that's coming towards Aaron and not one guy like knifing through right at him, you see what his his skill set, his ability, his elusiveness, like all that changes a little bit because there's not just one dude bearing down at him at an angle he can't really account for. Crazy thing is the Bills will get Tredavious White back uh, in the near future as well, which is just adding a potential, you know, Pro Bowl caliber corner to that defense. Yeah, and as you mentioned, Micah Hyde out with the injury, which is unfortunate because he's one of the best safeties in this league. It's crazy to think that that team could be even better than what they are. But um, speaking of safety, not Micah Hyde, uh, one on the Packers side of the ball, I know the Bills are extremely talented. They're going to give a lot of teams a lot of problems. I thought this was a really tough game for Darnell Savage. Wanted to get your thoughts on his play, uh, both in this game and on the season as a whole. Obviously had to play with Josh Allen sort of, you know, in the open field. Missed him entirely. Allen gets down to the one-yard line. There's a play in the hole where he's got the ability to stop the run for probably like a five-yard gain. Again, basically misses entirely. Running back goes on for, I don't know, 20-plus yard gain, something like that. Um, just a, a, a tough game for Darnell Savage. I think he's had a number of tough. This this was a bad game. Uh, I'm sure he'd say that the tackling. Here's all I need to say about the tackling, but because I like I did this as a profession in NFL buildings is, is help teach guys how to tackle more efficiently. And what I have always found is that when you are at, at an NFL level athlete, if you as a group, because our group does not tackle well, but if your safeties are you know, if you are not tackling well then your coach is not making it a priority. And that it's really that simple. And I, I don't know their coaching staff. I don't know what they do during practice. But if you are not tackling well, then your coach is not breaking down what your kind of root cause area of opportunity is. Like, for example, it is easy to see that Darnell Savage does not know how to decelerate under control so that he can step into a tackle under control. He, he just continues to show that he can't do it. And if you show that, that is a mechanical problem that you can fix, and you can fix within two weeks. And I'm not. This is not. I'm not blowing smoke. We have. I've. I've. We have done this in practice, but you have to be willing to do it as a player. But you have to institute it as a coaching staff. Like, let's figure out what mechanically we're doing wrong here, because none of these guys want to look like fools. It's not like he's afraid of contact. He's just literally not doing it the way he should be. And I think what's most frustrating from like from an ex player, a guy who just wants to see players do well regardless of what team they're on, yep. just play at a high level. It is frustrating to see the basics of the sport being looked over. That there's no good lineman because nobody can block. We have safeties that can't tackle. Like it's not a coincidence that the way that we teach this stuff has greatly diminished, and the product is not as good as it used to be. And so Darnell Savage. You have to take it upon yourself to look at film, understand, I have a problem with tracking. I have a problem with deceleration. I need to work on these things. If I work on them, I will get better rapidly because I'm an elite-level athlete who can pick up stuff really fast. 
but I have to do two things. I tell the, I tell my 14 year old son, the same thing. You have to admit that you have a problem and you have to be willing to work on it when other people might give you, you know, you, you have to be willing to take short-term pain for long-term gain. It's really, and, and Andy, yeah. I'm just telling you, it's like anything else in the world. It's that simple. It's not easy to do, but it's pretty simple. I try to tell uh, my son and when I coach their soccer team, the same thing. It's like, it's like leveling up in a video game, right? Like it, when everyone is leveling up their characters, leveling up their players, you got to grind, you got to beat all the little enemies and then the bigger enemies. And then you get the better sword and then you get the better, etc. Like you have, it takes time to level up or whatever game you're playing. It's the same thing in life. Like if you're not putting, if you're not putting in the grind, if you're not putting in the little things, you're not going to level up. You're not going to get better. And it's it's like one big video game, and nobody's getting the the, the rewards because nobody's putting in the time. Um, I, I talked about it yesterday. Um, you get what you tolerate, right? Like, and it seems like this is a Packers team that tolerates poor tackling, um, that tolerates. Poor punt protection. I mentioned the stat yesterday. They're the worst in the league in punt protection, uh, worst in the league in hang time, probably in great part due to the lack of protection for Pat O'Donnell. Um, they are struggling with fundamentals uh, on both of the lines, and they seem to be tolerating that. And um, <clears throat> you either get what you you know push for or you get what you tolerate, and it seems like this team is just tolerating a little bit uh, too many uh, imperfections at the moment. I agree completely with everything you just said. Uh, I'll just say it another way. Elite level athletes are programmed to jump over whatever hur whatever hurdle you set for them. So if I set a hurdle that is ankle level, right? They're just gonna and they're and and they're and if you don't set that for them, they're gonna disappoint you. That's just how they're programmed. Give them an objective, give them a measurement, and they will do everything they can. That's that's how they're designed. So if you set this really short hurdle, or if you don't set any expectations. They're going to trip over themselves every time. But if you set the hurdle, if you set the bar high, if perfection is what you're going for every time, they're not going to get there, but they're going to try to do it as best as possible. And that's why you see, like, really, the teams that we consistently say are very well coached. Mike Vrabel walks into every single stadium in the country, in the National Football League, with the team he's designed and his, and his staff coaches. And he says, I don't care about everything else. We are going to be tougher than you at the line of scrimmage. We're well coached. We block better. We take on blocks. We tackle. We do all the basics really, really well. They don't have a plethora of talent at any given position, I said, aside from obviously the running back, but they do the basics as well as anybody in the league. So they can walk into a Kansas City Chiefs game where they're 12 and a half point underdogs and go, We actually think we're going to win this game because we know we're going to win the line of scrimmage. And that is valuable, man. And yes. I don't know why we don't like, – all these coaches get out here and they get hired for schemes and they can draw stuff on Vizio. And nobody's teaching these players how to block and tackle anymore. And it just – for guys like me, it just drives me insane. Yeah, the lack of fundamentals around the league is frustrating. And I think it's a, in a large part why we're seeing some of the scoring down and not as great of a product on the field as you've been mentioning Let's, let's move to some positives. We did see some flashes from some, some young players in this game. Romeo Dobbs has a couple of gorgeous catches, including the one in the end zone, which was a spectacular catch. Uh, we see a Samori Toure touchdown. Um, nice job separating and kind of doing what Aaron Rodgers wanted him to do uh, to separate and get back to the space uh, in the middle of the field. You had another Kingsley and Igbari play behind the line of scrimmage. He's starting to stack those game by game. We talked about Zach Tom, some of the positives there. So we are seeing, at least from some of these rookies, some steps in the right direction. I actually thought Quay uh, played pretty well yeah. up until the point where he got <laughs> ejected for pushing a coach on the sideline, uh, which is not exactly a, a thing you want to do. But um, overall, I did feel like we saw some flashes from some of the younger players on this team. Yeah, certainly. It, you just... You always look at a draft class and how many guys can help immediately and, and bring that impact immediately. And we have some guys that are doing that. And I think it's great to see, you know, particularly a, a Barry of 55. When he came out, you, you go, okay, he's a little bit undersized, but man, he's like his, his get off time is ridiculous. And you, we've got to be able to do something with that. And he's just kind of figuring his way out in the league. And you, you can kind of project him now a couple of years from now, he puts on 15, 20 pounds, upper body strength. You go, man, he could really be something as long as they have a guy there that can really you know, teach him how to work hands and work angles. Um, I, I agree with, with you on, on the Quay statement. You know, he just seems to be with, for all the reasons that I wouldn't want to play him early, there are things that he can do extremely well. But I think the problem that I was, I, I don't have a problem with Quay, but I do have like, uh, I do have a reservation where I know Chris Barnes, when they're running a trade block with a tight end, tight end comes off on Chris Barnes. 
Chris Barnes buries him in the hole. Blow it up. Way yeah. lets him take him on five yards back and makes it, but he'll make the tackle, but it'll be nine yards back, right? And so that's really why we were excited about him last week when he can kind of get off a little bit more, make some rushes, do some things that are kind of pre designed, predetermined, so he can use his athleticism. It's harder to do that against the Buffalo Bills, granted, but he's certainly improving every week is which is what you want to see and you know the bar is high i think at the linebacker position when you're a first round draft pick that's just what is what it is but i i agree with you man it's nice to see these it's nice to see these guys contributing certainly the receiver position you know that's going to just continue to be a work in progress if if not for the entirety of this year if you know if not for a couple years unless they make some some major changes in that room next year so um i it's good to see some 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 things happening with some of these younger guys it's just the timeline right now is just not to our advantage. No, it's not. And, you know, the, the, the thing about Andy Barry and Zach Tom, when both those guys got to camp, I'm like, oh, those are basically going to be redshirt players because they need to put on 15 pounds of strength and muscle and functional sure. strength and muscle and just be a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. You could just tell that they weren't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but, man, both those guys from a – like a, a – Zach Tom, from a technique standpoint, you said he's just, you know, he, he can do some things that a lot of offensive line can't do. And then Enig Barry has got some some tricks up his sleeve that, you know, even some of the Rashawn Garys, you know, don't have um, from a from a move set stand, standpoint in, in, in putting some moves together. So um, I'm, I've been impressed with both those guys. They're not there yet. It's going to take time. They still need to put on functional strength. But I would say both of those players, especially as day three draft picks, ahead of the curve from what you would expect. And Romeo yeah. Dobbs, same thing. Yeah, and, and I you could you could be right on on your first assessment, and they're still doing well, right? Like they probably shouldn't be in the game. Yeah, but you know you have a when you have a Jonathan Garvin who has no production, no spraying in front of you, then you're gonna you're gonna give the rookie a chance because he's at least got speed. When you the, nobody's been able to really fill the gaps because of all the injuries in the offensive line, and because of that, you know we had we've had guys go through there. Um, you know, Jen, uh, is it Jake Hansen got hurt, and then Royce obviously struggled. So you have players that you thought were going to play in front of these guys, and but it's so cool, just as a fan, as a player, whatever. It's so cool to see guys at a young age who get an opportunity, and they don't have to be perfect, but they are making the most of it. I think it's it's just it's cool to see. It's cool. Totally I'm happy for them. Totally agreed. Uh, hopefully we can keep that as a positive moving forward and these rookies can continue to progress through the remainder of the season. Also crazy that uh, this Packers team needs so much help along the offensive line and third round pick Sean Ryan's not even in the conversation, but that's another conversation for another day. Um, let's talk about uh, Packers Hall of Fame. Cool news this week. Jordy Nelson and Josh Sitton uh, will be the next two players inducted into the Packers Hall of Fame. Want to get your thoughts on that, but also want to get your thoughts on anyone that you think may not be in the Packers Hall of Fame who should be there. I saw Nick Barnett tweet out this week uh, asking whether or not he should be a Packer Hall of Famer. So I'll let your, uh, get you give your thoughts on that as well. Yeah. So uh, first thing I'm going to say is Mike Flanagan is not in the Packers Hall of Fame. And I just, I honestly have no idea what they're thinking. Like he was such the problem that happens with sometimes with, with these teams is like Matt Burke and um Olin Krutz are in Chicago and Minnesota respectively. And, and yep. they kind of they kind of get their start before Mike does. And they're all pros and they're really good. And Mike doesn't clamor for Pro Bowl votes like some other guys did. And Mike doesn't, you know, go out there and, and per, you know go for that stuff. So Mike has like one Pro Bowl, maybe. Mike is one of the best offensive linemen that has ever played in Green Bay, period. He's the best hands I've ever seen. For people who don't remember, just put this in context. When Chad Clifton went down. I was going to ask you about this. Yep. Mike Flanagan went out and played left tackle and, and pitched shutouts against Alex Smith. Excuse me, Bruce Smith, when he was trying to get his sack record. Pitched a shutout, took Bruce out of the game in the third quarter. He was sick of getting beat up by a backup, a backup left tackle who played center. Uh, we used, I used to, I'll tell you a story that kind of sums up Michael Flanagan for me. We're playing the Chicago Bears at home, and Mike's playing. I'm playing against. I think it must have been Tommy Harris at the time. Mike's playing against Alex. Uh, gosh, what was his name? Number ninety five. Hmm. Played there for a long. Uh, Anthony uh, Adams. No, gosh darn it. It's not no, 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 not 95, not in the interior. It was a, 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 a defensive end. Maybe it was a 95. Oh, gotcha. Maybe it was 96. But but uh, anyways, we're, he's playing against the guy. I'm literally at the point in the game 
betting the defensive end who I'm not playing against, and I have to deal with time, you know, all this other stuff. I'm betting, I'm telling the guy that it's a pass and that he can't beat our backup left tackle. He can't beat our center at left tackle. I'm betting the guy every snap and he never beat him. And Mike's like, what are you doing? I go, dude, he can't beat you. Like, you're too good. I'm betting him. Think about, I mean, think about it. We're in an NFL game. Yep. And I, I'm like, he, Mike is so good at left tackle that I can bet the guy across from him that he can't beat him. That's not, yeah. I mean, he's that good. And he's, he's a hell of a player. He's, he's been shut out. And I just, there's some guys that get in and you're happy for everybody, but you go, come on, man. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. No, he's definitely a player that's deserving uh, to get in. Uh, what about Nick Barnett? You think uh, Nick should be there? How many years did Nick play there? I think so. I think the short answer is with some of the guys that have, that have gone in, you know, certainly like Nick's, Nick's, you know, you look at, I don't know what the criteria is, I guess, but I would say that um, I would, just say that the contribution they made as as a teammate, as a as a um, as kind of a respected person at that position for the length of time that they played there, I think that's that's really important. Um, I tend to, especially now with all the the way that the Pro Bowl has gone, it's like it's it's such a joke now, even more so than it was when I was there because guys don't even show up. So there's like 80 Pro Bowlers. Um, all this, all of that kind of postseason stuff, I would throw out the window. It's like Mark Tausch is a good example. Like Mark Tausch never made it to a pro Bowl because he played right tackle, but like, like he's he's a legit, really, really good player in this league. And I mean, he's very deserving of being there. But I think under some, you know, some criteria, if he wasn't, I don't, I don't know if he, I don't know if it's as obvious for for everybody um, if he's not a Wisconsin product from Wisconsin. Just because I think a lot of it seems like a lot of that stuff is based on like, well, he made three Pro Bowls or this or that and the other thing. It's like that, you know, Mark was a from day one, a really, really good player. And that's all that should matter. And I kind of feel that way about a guy like Nick and certainly a guy like Mike. And yeah, Mike Flanagan, uh, Nick Barnett and Josh Sitton all played eight seasons in Green Bay. Uh, Jordy played nine, so mm -hmm. right all in the same, same yeah, realm. Josh, Josh, and Jordy. So, jo I'll tell you a story about Josh. So, Josh goes down to Miami, right? And I'm down there. So, we, I, I, Josh did at this point, he, he's he's not thrilled about football, he's playing football, but he's not like he's not young Josh Shitton, right? He's but, right, so he's super talented, he's just not as motivated. But he goes out and he's he's you know trying to get out of practices and this and that. He doesn't want to lift and this and that. But then he goes out into this. He, we played this uh, scrimmage. I can't remember if it was a scrimmage or like preseason game. And he played like a, it was a scrimmage. He played a perfect a perfect scrimmage. Yeah, he didn't have a single bad snap. I'm talking about he didn't have a single like. However, if the coach is doing like pluses and minuses, he didn't have one plus minus. They were all plus. I mean, he was it was perfect. And I go, oh, like man, that guy's pretty good. Yeah, he's amazing. And uh, Jordy, of course, is a shoe in with all his stats and everything, and, and the, what he contributed to to Aaron's career and whatnot. But those guys are well deserving, man. I just sometimes when I hear this stuff, I, I I'm, it's a head scratcher that some guys are in and some guys aren't. No, I think that's always yeah, and there's I don't I don't think there's like a set criteria criteria or anything. It's uh, you know I'm sure there's a lot that goes into it, but no, Mike Flanagan definitely a deserving player. Hopefully, he can get uh, in at some point. Um, fine, or like, really quick uh, thoughts about Packers Lions this week. Uh, we talked about it off air. Uh, if you're ever going to get healthy, like if, you're, if your offense is an alien, then you're ever going to get healthy, it would be against the Lions defense. Um, I would just say that it's fun to watch Malcolm Rodriguez, the, the, like the six-round pick, because he's the thumper. Um, Aiden Hutchinson's going to be a challenge because he, he, his, his motor is ridiculous. But they do not have good players. And they do not run uh, – their system is not built for their players. They're – their technique is poor. Their eye discipline is poor. They're an absolute – they're a disaster in the secondary. And I know they just fired their guy. But I, I, we talked about it before. Like I, I watched tape on these guys, and you just – you almost can't believe what you're seeing given who they're playing against. And so I, you would think that – like last week, they're, <laughs> they're playing single safety high for half the game against Tyree Kill and Jaden Waddle, and you're just going, really? Like, you're really going to do that? Or they're going to – or they like – They'll play quarters, but they'll all sit at the sticks and let Tyree Kill run by, right by him, like full, full, full head of steam. Yeah, I remember they're that. flat, they're flat foot, and he's got a ten year head start. And you're going, uh oh, what are you coaching? Like I don't even understand what's going on. Now on offense, they can score a ton of points, and I know they got shut up by the Patriots, and they haven't been as prolific. I know Ben Johnson personally. Ben and I worked together in Miami. Ben is a incredibly smart human being. He is a very, very good 
schematic guy and the, the way that he's sequencing plays and the amount of stuff that they have to run and, and the fact that they have one of the top three, four, five offensive lines in the entire league led by Hank Fraley, their coach. They are doing an incredible job. They've done, gone through some injuries as well, but they are they are very, very talented up front and it allows them to utilize Swift and, uh, you know, St. Brown and all those. I mean, Jared Goff looks really good sometimes because he has time. Other times they make him move his feet. He doesn't look so good. But it's going to be a challenge on defense for sure. I think offensively, you'd be disappointed if we don't have a three in front of our, in front of our you know, our, our, our final score. Uh, and hopefully the three in the, the the first digit with another digit after it. Not That's just what I mean. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I, I guess this year that could be either, right? Yeah. Never know. Uh, Mike, fantastic stuff as always. I always put the rundown together and I'm like, yeah, maybe this might be a shorter episode. Maybe this one will just be 20 minutes and then we get talking ball and it's just always phenomenal. So appreciate you so freaking much. Uh, thanks for everything that you do. Tell the people where we can follow you on Twitter and where we can find your work. Yeah, MikeWell68 on Twitter, Process to Perform on Instagram. Check out our uh, On My Block podcast. You can check it out on our YouTube, our Process to Perform YouTube channel, or you can check it out any, uh, anywhere you get your podcast. We've been doing a lot of video breakdown lately, Andy, so if you guys are interested in checking that stuff out, Definitely go on the YouTube channel, uh, Process to Perform. We got the last couple of weeks on there. It's it's uh, it's a good read or good it's, watch, I guess. It's phenomenal stuff. And Mike is uh, criminally under followed on Twitter. So please go out there on Twitter and follow him as well at MikeWall68. You can follow the podcast at Packaday Podcast. You can follow me at Andy Herman NFL. That's going to do it for Mike and I today. We will see you next week. I will see you tomorrow. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.